New Zealand king salmon do amazing things in relatively small marine spaces. Just a few hectares in the Marlborough Sounds sustains this multi-million dollar industry. There is, of course, much more to this story than ocean farms. The New Zealand King Salmon story actually starts with some of the purest water in the world, water which bubbles out of the ground at Pupu Springs near Takaka. Combine a fantastic environment with an incredible food source and you have an unbeatable combination. King Salmon are also known in some places as Chinook. They are ideally suited to life in both fresh and seawater. In their natural state, they are born in fresh water, spend their life at sea, and then return to fresh water to spawn. The environment is critical to their welfare, and farm-reared salmon are no different. Gaining the best quality from the farm-reared salmon necessitates a lot of clever people getting things dead right. Welcome to New Zealand King Salmon's Hatchery in Takaka. It all starts with the water. Uh, across the way is Pupu Springs, uh, renowned uh, for the clarity and purity of the water. And that water is gravity fed uh, into the hatchery. So we're going to follow this process through. And if you want sensational salmon, you can't go past New Zealand King Salmon. The best quality product you will ever taste. So tell us about the springs and the relationship to the salmon farm. Okay, well, the springs themselves, they're our essence. So all of this fresh water, if, if this water's coming through so pure, so clean, so clear, it's creating the perfect environment to breed these fish. So if you, if you start with dirty water, you have to clean it first. Our water is already beautiful. Without it, we wouldn't have the salmon farm the way it is. We wouldn't be able to breed what we breed. Our fish is the best fish in the world. First of all, we have our fish in a really beautiful and a special place as Takaka, with one of the most pure water in the world. We don't need to use any chemical. We don't use, need to use any antibiotics. We don't need to use any vaccine of them, on them. So it's a completely natural farming, the one that we have there with the Brewster. Producing top quality fish requires the best parents, who in turn supply the best eggs. The whole hatchery process is geared to quality. Nothing is left to chance. I had, I soon realised, a great deal to learn about farming salmon. Various mysterious looking dark roofs covered some of the pools. Others were open to the sky and still others contained a few monstrous fish. Our next stop though was the hatchery and a lesson on eggs, incubation and transporting salmon stock. The egg growth phase can be influenced by the use of light and temperature. The water from the Pupu Springs is always 11 and a half degrees, between 11 and a half and 11.7, so we don't have to change that. The only other way that you alter the fish or you trick the fish into when summer or winter is, is with light. We have covers over our ponds and lights in our ponds. So we okay. can have the lights on 24-7 at summer and then we can put them into a covered area and have the lights on for eight hours or even four hours and then it's winter. So you do that in a logical sequence and therefore they think it's summer or winter? Exactly. And to make sure that the fish are okay, we first ultrasound the females to make sure the eggs are large enough. If your eggs are too small, they won't be viable. They may fertilise, but the hatchlings will be too small and they don't quite work. So we jump in the water, we ultrasound all our females, and if they've got a big enough egg, they can go into winter. Two months after being in winter, we have the eggs. And they come here? Fertilise them, put them in the trays, yes. How long before they hatch? 540 degree days. So a degree day is, our water will be, we use 12 degrees. 31 days before you can see the eye, and they're at an eyed egg, so you're able to handle them then. And then 540 degree days is another three weeks after that, I believe. The temperature's relevant because we're able to chill them right down. So we could use four degree water, and an egg put in 12 degree water versus an egg put in four degree water, the 12 degree water egg will be hatched three months before the chilled one. So we're able to stagger and, and oh, spread okay. out when our eggs are hatching based on temperature. 
Well, OK, so from an aquaculture or fish farming perspective, you really can control your stock levels? Yes, yes we can. With, with lights first, so we put them in winter before they're ready to go, two months before. So you hold some groups back and keep them in summer. So we have that part first, and then we can extend it even further by chilling the water. When they're at the eyed egg stage, prior to hatching, we put them in a, into poly boxes and they go into an insulated box and sent to our other hatcheries for ongoing for the for stocking of our sea pens. Okay. So they go when they're an eyed egg. Rather than transporting a fish or a young fish, we're transporting them when they're fertilised, just about ready to hatch egg. You can put in one box 30,000 eggs, but yeah. you can't put 30,000 fish into no. one single box. So and the insulated egg boxes that we send them just goes on the back of a trailer and travels up and down the South Island and they're quite happy in there. So how many eggs? So in this room, this room itself, uh, six million in one go at one wow. time. So, so far we've got some of the purest water in the world here to start the, the egg process. But the source, of course, is this amazing spring, Poo Poo Spring. And I've got a feeling as a food source, you're going to wind up with the best possible quality uh, that you can get. So I think it's time to go and see something a little bigger. <laughs> New Zealand king salmon found that some of their fish didn't spawn. Recently, they've decided to let those fish continue to grow rather than harvest them. These fish grow very large indeed. They call them taiyi, and a limited number of special large taiyis are being introduced to the market. In British Columbia, Canada, there is a club known as the Taiyi Club. As an angler, the Taiyi Club fascinates me, as too do these beautiful big king salmon. We are now in the waters of the Taiyi Club of British Columbia. It's a fishery that's existed since 1924 and targets fish that are unique in that they're Chinook and large Chinook and that they hang off the river mouth in the waters here for a couple of months, making them accessible to anglers who want to go through the very difficult uh, rules of catching them, which means being rowed using 20 pound test line maximum and a single barbless hook. The only way you can get in the club, you gotta catch a fish over 30 pounds. A lot of people out here are already in it. A lot of people are looking to get in it. You can fish years with ever getting to one over 30 pounds. But when you do, you're part of history. When you hit that fish in this fishery, it's, it's right there. It's not 100 feet down. It's maybe 40, 60 feet. And you hit it, you hold the rod, and then it goes like snot. And all you can do then is just chase it, wait for it to stop, and then the rower and the angler fight it together. But uh, it's just something, for long, dull hours, all of a sudden explodes into just something insane. It's the ones that are 29, that are close, and we're going, don't bleed too much. <laughs> we, we need every ounce of weight. And then you go to shore, it's so cool because there's always people there, there's a fire going, and that's where the weigh scales are. So you take it up and you drop it on the, on the gravel in front of the weigh scale, and the weigh master weighs it, you don't get to weigh it. And when it's going up, you know it'll go like this, that's the, the weigh scale, and as it's doing that, everybody's going, ooh, 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 and it's either gonna be, yeah, or it's gonna be, oh. <laughs> you can't beat the experience. Just, especially when you catch the fish. Nothing matches it. Now, Taiyi is a Canadian Indian name, which means big or chief. So, in Campbell River in British Columbia, you can catch a Taiyi salmon. And there's all sorts of protocols and rules and regulations. These massive fish also are particularly tasty. So from a culinary perspective, New Zealand king salmon are introducing Taiyi to the world market. 
So we're just going to capture one and give you a look at one of these massive beasts. The only way we could handle one of these beasts was to slow it down for a few minutes with a tranquilizer. Welcome to the world of Taiyi salmon, big, beautiful, very special fish. Aura King is New Zealand King Salmon's premium product, but Taiyi are like a limited edition cut above. The best cuts of bluefin tuna command an absolute premium in the sashimi market. Well, Taiyi are the salmon equivalent. So what we have here is 14 kilo Taiyi. Now she's three years old. Beautiful condition. Just gorgeous. It's quite heavy. We have a tag on them. The tag has a barcode and a number. And with that barcode and the number, we're able to track their progress right up to this level. So we can try and learn the growth rate on these fish and be able to predict a bit better for farming purposes. She's upright, she's off the bottom, she's not flapping. She'll be very quick very, very soon. <laughs> you won't be able to catch her in a minute. Well, th this is a, a, a different type of king salmon. It's still a king salmon, but it's a slow maturing, large growing king salmon. So these fish in this farm are normally harvested at about four kilos. A Taiyi doesn't mature and it can go through to up to eight years of age. We think they can get to maybe 60 kilos. So I've seen some that are almost as big as a person. Our, we, we only found out about them two years ago. So they've always been here, but because we've only grown them to four kilos and never let any go on from there, we didn't really understand that we had them amongst our existing cohort. So. Uh, it was a great surprise to find out that we've got them. Now we're starting to grow them and breed from them. You've seen some at our hatchery and they easily 20 kilos at the moment. We couldn't catch a bigger fish, but certainly saw fish over 20 kilos. As for 60 kilos, I can't wait to see that. Getting to know what is possible with Taiyi is going to take time, but New Zealand King Salmon know their farm product well and know what it takes to produce the best fish for the market. Getting things right in Takaka means getting the product right for the market. You know, we uh, measure um, our uh, farming by density. Okay, so a standard density overseas of farming is between 80 till 90 kilos per cubic meters of water. You can find some, find some hatcheries with up to 100 kilos of fish per cubic meter of water. Uh, in our hatchery, we have up to 13 kilos of fish per cubic meter of water. So that's why uh, we are able to create this premium product with, and we don't use any chemical during, during this process. Why we say that it's a unique breed? Because it's really isolated for many, many years. So, and uh, our breeding program is in base of families. So we have 150 families in the company right now. We choose the best families in different aspects, okay? So this evaluation is, for example, color, the percentage of fat, the growth, uh, the perfect fish. That's what we are looking for. We have been doing that for more than 20 years. So from more than 20 years, we have been crossing the best fish with the best fish. And also, we have been avoiding the crosses that we don't want to do between the same families to reduce the inbreeding um, issues. That's why our unique breed is so unique, because you cannot find this um, King Salmon in other places. Our first trip to one of the Tory Channel farms took place in less than ideal conditions. It was a reminder of why location is important. A farm should be tucked out of reach of a storm. You want cold water below 16 degrees, but for good growth, not below 11 degrees. Fast flowing water above one knot is important, and a depth of 50 metres is ideal. Tory Channel ticks the boxes. Here we are on uh, Namahau Farm. It's one of our, or well, one of the eight sea farms that we're running at the moment. We've got three pens on this farm, they're uh, 40 by 40 metre. Uh, pens, got 90,000 fish in each pen. 
So that's at harvest, that's about 2.5% uh, fish, and the remainder of the um, pen is full of water. In the front two pens there, we've got our uh, big fish. They're sitting at about four kilos. They're going to be ready in about a month's time. You'll get some really big ones. You know, they'll get up to six, seven kilos in the pen. Um, and of course, you'll get some smaller ones that'll be down around that sort of three, three and a half kilos. But that's that fits what the marketing or what our marketing team want or what what our customers want. So we feed our salmon uh, these pellets. And in the, in the pellets is basically proteins and oils. So the protein is for the growth and the oil is for the energy for the fish. And that's what actually gives them the heart healthy now, omega 3s. Why different sizes? So different size pellets. So the small pellets there, they're, f they're for the smolt. Um, they've got lots and lots of protein because sm uh, the smaller fish um, need lots of protein to grow. And the larger pellets, they're for the larger fish. Uh, slightly less protein and a little bit more fat because they need the fat for the energy. So this here is basically the control centre of Namahau Farm. Uh, we've got a computer system here that controls our feeders. Um, our feeding system is basically a pneumatic blower that blows the food uh, out into the salmon pens and the food sprinkled over the top of the pen. When the fish are hungry they'll come up to the top of the pen and they'll just feed actively in the top sort of three, four, five metres of water. Um, every pen's got a camera and it's five metres deep looking upwards. And what I can do is I can gauge how full the fish or how sated the fish are and decide when to shut the, shut the food off. Now feed's about 70% of our production costs, so we don't want to be wasting any food at all. Um, and in fact, if we tarp the bottoms of our pens off, um, we find that there's less than 0.01% of our food actually leaves the, uh, leaves the net. And what our procedure is, is once we get one pallet past the camera at five metres, we shut the feeder off. Um, and that's the end of the meal for the day. So salmon are really, really um, efficient converters of feed to flesh. So basically they'll eat uh, 1.7 kilos of this food and they'll grow a kilo. Um, so, yeah, so it's incredible and you compare that or contrast that to land animals that have to keep themselves warm and support themselves against gravity, you know, that can be five kilos of food to a kilo of weight. This is just laden with heart healthy omega 3s, it's a really good protein source, it's, it's a fantastic product, it really is. Originally they were made up of fish meal or just fish meal and fish oil, um, but since the fisheries are so limited, what we've done and the demand for salmon is so high, what we do is we substitute in other proteins from other protein sources and oils from other oil sources. So that's how we can maintain production and still deliver a, um, a really good product. There are always challenges in any farming venture, and salmon farming is no exception. Our big challenges down here in the Tory Channel are um, we've got quite a strong current, and we need that current. You know, that, that current brings the nice, cool, clean water in from the Cook Strait in for our salmon. Um, and we need to be able to hold the farm or position the farm in place, so we've got a very, quite a technical screw anchoring system where we monitor all the, all the forces on each of the anchors. Um, and the other thing we need to do is we need to weight our nets so they're nice and square to stop the current um, impacting on the net. And you'll notice right around the farm we've got what's called a predator net. And that predator net encompasses or it basically keeps the seals out of the farm. Predator fencing keeps the seals out, but that doesn't mean they don't try their best to break in. All of these salmon have to be irresistible. Mark, how many people does it take to run a farm like this? So a farm of this size, we've got two people that are out here staying on shift, so they work seven days on, seven days off. And then there's a day crew that come out five days a week. So there'll be about three people in the day crew, so about five people to run this farm in total. And then we'll have a harvest team uh, coming in to harvest the fish after that. So basically five people can grow a thousand tonnes of fish. So it's pretty efficient. Wow, that is, that is efficient. And at harvest time, on average, how much are you harvesting? We're harvesting 35 tonne a day, five days a week, right through the year. We're the, we're the only king salmon producer in the world that does this. And uh, So every day, 35 tonne? Every day we harvest 35 tonnes of Is, of is that spread across the eight farms? Yes, so we're harvesting 35 tonne a day from any of our eight sites that we're currently running at the moment. 
Well, that's consistent supply to the market too, isn't it? Exactly. So and it's just what the customers want. They want fresh, premium salmon seven days a week. And that's how we meet the market demand. We have a dog whose coat shines in the sunlight. She is healthy, fit, and just loves salmon dog food. She is also the pin-up girl for Omega Plus. Nothing in the salmon process is wasted. This is a pet power pack. So uh, our division, we've uh, looked at a number of different products, different categories where we could uh, take our remaining raw materials. Uh, that material makes, is made up of heads and frames, uh, skin, uh, trimmings and similar uh, products. And how we could take those products, capture them uh, at an excellent quality, and then what we could possibly do with those to get value from those. So we did a, a lot of work in uh, the area of, of byproduct utilisation, uh, identified some areas of interest uh, that we wanted to explore further. Uh, and one of those uh, that came up to the uh, surface of the uh, list, or the top of the list quite quickly, was uh, pet food. Uh, the more we looked at the pet food uh, category, both uh, domestically and internationally, the more we became interested. Essentially, a lot of the input products for uh, all of these came from the offal bin. I had the nickname of the seagull uh, in the company for a long time because I stood over offal bins and I pulled things out and I saw interest in those. And a lot of our treats range, uh, which are freeze-dried, came from those, uh, those products where they were going to offal bins, I could see the potential for them. So we started to capture those that fit for human grade consumption, uh, take them uh, or capture them before they went into offal, uh, freeze those down and process them. Uh, similarly with our uh, dry product, we use a lot of salmon heads. The reason why we use the heads is because of the, the high omega-3 content. Well, omega-3s are very good uh, in helping uh, reduce the effects of autoimmune diseases. Uh, that includes the likes of psoriasis, arthritis, uh, asthma. There's all sorts of uh, problems that both animals and humans can, uh, can suffer from uh, if they don't have a, a diet rich in omega-3s. So by providing that to them, we can assist in a lot of things, uh, you know, reducing those effects. Uh, uh, another one would be allergens, which have become very, very popular or very common in, in pets currently with, with the food that they're eating. Another area where salmon byproducts plays an important role is recreational angling, where salmon burley proves itself to be ideal. Uh, if we are truly want to consider ourselves sustainable, it's making sure that, you know, from the nose to the tail, we're trying to utilise everything in between. Our second visit to Tory Channel coincided with perfect weather. A clear, beautiful Marlborough Sounds day, ideal to learn about harvesting and get a step closer to a succulent feast. Filming Ocean Bounty is like spending days in the most perfect classroom imaginable. All over New Zealand, Kiwis are doing amazing things on and under the water. When there is product to harvest, the barge comes in and the workforce swells significantly. New Zealand King Salmon is the world's largest supplier, producing just over 50% of farm King Salmon. To put that in perspective though, that only represents about 0.7% of the world's supply. Most salmon found around the world is Atlantic Salmon. New Zealand King Salmon is, however, in a class of its own. Potential for growth in the industry is huge. Opportunities for growth, however, strictly limited. Aquaculture is not well understood by people and in many cases the numbers are too good to be true. This farm can produce about 2,000 tonnes of salmon annually. It's a little over one surface hectare and that means it can produce about the same quantity of protein as a 25,000 hectare beef farm. Yeah, so this farm can produce about one third of what we need for salmon in New Zealand. So uh, it is amazingly efficient. But a, a stunning fact is, it's 98% water, only 2% fish. So despite that incredible productivity and producing 2,000 tonnes of fish, it's 98% space, 2% fish when it's at its most dense. So uh, again, that's because we've got three dimensions to play with and not just two, we can get a great outcome in terms of welfare for the fish. New Zealand is in a unique place here. There's only five farmers of any scale in the world that produce king salmon. With only one exception, they're all in New Zealand. So we produce most of the world's aquaculture king salmon. And it's at the very pinnacle of all the salmon species. It's the size of the salmon, 
and the eating quality. So you get an amazingly orange flesh. It's got a high oil content, incredible flavour as a result of that. So uh, that's why it's so popular with chefs and fishermen alike around the world. Harvest time attracts everyone in the ocean, hoping for a morsel or free feed. Clearly predator control is important and the work ongoing to find the best solutions. The harvest process utilises water as a key ingredient. Preserving product quality is obviously very high on the agenda and continuing to keep fish wrapped in a protective layer of seawater assists greatly. Grant, they're harvesting behind us. Yes. Describe the process. So first of all we put in what's called a sweep net and we take out a small proportion of the fish. They go into a more crowded chamber. From there they're pumped with a huge pump uh, up onto the vessel you see behind us. In, they go into a chamber with rushing water. They want to naturally swim towards that and they do. They swim into a smaller chamber and they're humanely knocked on the head and from there they go into the tanker that you see and then down to our processing facility. This farm as an employer, yeah. or fish farming per se as an mm. employer, yeah. what, what sort of employment opportunities exist yeah. and how far reaching is that into the community? Oh, so there's there's a, a lot of people here harvesting today. Sure there are, oh, there's a massive number of opportunities. So firstly our employment rate for every surface hectare Within our company, we employ about 80 people, believe it or not. So every, every productive surface hectare employs about 80 people. That's because we do all of our processing in New Zealand. Uh, and we do a lot of smoking, a lot of really value-added products. So that employs a lot of people. But we employ everything from veterinarians, to accountants, to marketing people, to process workers, to boat operators, to crane operators, to harvesters. The, the range is huge, so if you're in aquaculture, you could be an accountant, you could be a, a, a social media person posting stuff on the internet, you could be a marketing person, you could be in sales. I mean, some of our best jobs are in New York City, for example, meeting with top chefs and restaurateurs, uh, talking about Aura King Salmon, our premium brand. If you want to get the best from salmon, bring together some of the world's best chefs and let them loose. Raw, cooked, or a blend of both, salmon is a tasty, succulent, versatile product that both chefs and consumers just love. Oh. Yeah, Aura King is our premium uh, fish for restaurants. We've been classically breeding that fish for nearly 30 years now. So we take the, the, the best males, the best females, and we cross them classically like a, a sheep or cattle breeder would to get exactly what chefs want. We know the oil content they want, we know that you know, they want a silver skin, they want the bright orange colour, they want a certain firmness of flesh, so we breed to get exactly what they want, and that's what Aura King is. And this is not genetic modification. No. This is actually choosing the best parents mm. to produce the best progeny. Yes, so we have 150 different families of King Salmon, and then we, we know the properties of each one of those, and then we just classically cross them to get the outcome for Aura King that chefs are after. So there's a little more to this than meets the eye. It's not a matter of throwing a whole bunch of fish in a pen and sticking some food in there. Oh. And two and a half years later, harvest it. Yeah. Um, farming, just any sort of farming is hard. And fish farming, it, it's a, a new industry. Uh, we're the biggest producers of king salmon. That means we have to forge our own way. We have to find out our own technology, our own intellectual property. And that's why New Zealand is successful with king salmon when largely others aren't. One of the, the criticisms that's sometimes levelled is use of water space yep. and degradation of water space, what goes on underneath. You know, how much space are you occupying? Just run the stats by us. Right, so in terms of surface hectares, what you're seeing here today, we have 17 surface hectares available to us. Of, yeah, in the Marlborough Sound? In the Marlborough Sound. So the Marlborough Sounds is 150,000 surface hectares. The mussel guys grow mussels and they do a great job. They've got about 3,000 surface hectares and we've got 17, just one seven. And of that 17, nine is very poor, four is average, and four is outstanding. You're on one of the outstanding surface hectares. 
and those four surface hectares underpin all 500 jobs in the company. If we didn't have those, we, would, we wouldn't have a business, basically. So from four top producing hectares, mm. all of those opportunities accrue. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I oh, the, the, the value uh, outcomes that we can get for people, the employment outcomes, even the health outcomes. Uh, where the uh, salmon is the biggest contributor to long chain omega 3s in the New Zealand diet. That has an amazingly positive health outcome for Kiwis. Okay, health outcomes, environmental health. Mm. One last point on that because people seem to hit this pretty hard. Sure. We've got some footage that can show us underneath. Yeah. Now just tell us what's happening, yeah. what we're looking at with the footage. Yep. So, um, Fish, um, fish do their poo in the sea, They fish always have done that. The sea is amazingly adept at coping with fish poo because it's a pretty natural thing. Um, there'll be... You get the concentration though in a farm? Yeah, so the, the important thing is that it's sighted so that there's a little bit of dispersion and then that way, you know, the, the creatures under the farm, the, the organisms that break that down, can cope with it and they do an amazingly good job at that. So that's why you'll find a lot of life under a farm. You'll see a video with lots of mussels in it, lots of ribbon worms, uh, lots of living creatures that are helping to process that orga organic matter. And that's a great outcome for the environment because uh, you know the, there's, there's more life, not less. We passionately believe that aquaculture is literally going to save the planet. So we've got an increasing population. Uh, aquaculture already equals the world's total wild catch in terms of production, using a fraction of the Earth's resources to achieve that. Uh, that means that it's uniquely placed to increase food production, but in a, with a light environmental footprint. So that's the place of aquaculture. Within that, as Kiwis, we need to do something really premium. We have to earn our way in the world. So we need to, to produce premium species, uh, getting premium prices for them, uh, taking them to the world as branded food delicacies, really. And that's what we do with King Salmon. The salmon story fascinates me, and clearly in places like the Tokyo Fish Market, Aura King assumes a place alongside the highly prized bluefin tuna. Maybe soon a few very special Thai specimens will get to this market and reinforce our desire to provide premium product to the world's markets and to continually explore new opportunities. Aquaculture does have amazing potential for New Zealand, both for the supply of local consumption and as an export earner. Premium product at a premium price, showcasing our unique place in the world. They also highlight the fact that the best environment produces, in most cases, the best quality. Add to that Kiwi ingenuity and a dose of innovation, and the New Zealand brand becomes world leading. I wanted to haul one of these fish out of the farm and get it in front of award-winning chef Mark Soper. My son James eagerly volunteered for the task. Every job has its perks. Uh, Mine quite clearly is that it gets me into uh, great parts of New Zealand and I do, as you know, love this place with an absolute passion. This is breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, salmon farm here just seems to fit uh, and uh, another thing that it fits with, of course, is dinner. So I'm going to set my son James the challenge uh, of resting a salmon denizen of the deep uh, from its pen and thence onto the dinner table. Get him, mate. This is dinner. I've, got a, uh, I've talked it up. Oh, that's ah, a beauty. Got him again. Oh, what? Yep. Braid wouldn't be rotten, would it? Well, it's just. Wow. I can't that give him any slack. That was a beaut. Oh, well. Are we going home without a fish? No, no, no. You would think that catching a fish in a pen full of thousands would be easy but it took us a little longer than expected. But, as they say, good things come to those who wait. That's better, Sinker. Your hand line is uh, a little more successful than the other. That's a good fish. Look at that. 
beautiful colours on them. So is that the sort of salmon market would be Aura King quality? This would be Aura King quality. Look at the lovely silver scales. See the clear eyes? It's a really beautiful fish. You know, lovely gills. All these fins are, are perfectly intact. The graders will check the inside of the fish as well, check the belly wall um, all around there. It's, um, it's a beautiful fish. Beauty. Didn't take long to jump on the hook. It was virtually instant. I think we, maybe if we, two, maybe one more. Wow. Mark Soper, head chef at Porikoho Lodge, has won the Aura King Best Salmon Award two years in a row. This is why he deserves the accolades. I've done a terrible thing. I've taken a chef's recipe, an award-winning recipe, and I've shortened it uh, so that it will fit in the programme. So Mark Soper from Porikoho Lodge is just the most amazing chef when it comes to seafood, and salmon in particular. So I hate to do it, but here is the shortened version of a truly exceptional culinary opportunity. So what we've done, we've taken this beautiful piece of salmon, I've taken 90% of that fat off there with the skin, I'm going to take that now and I'm going to put it on a rolled out piece of salt dough. Now what that is, we've got in here some beautiful salt dough, it's flour, salt, some eggs and water to bind. We want to get this really nice sort of doughy texture, something that we can roll out. We're going to roll that up, not too thick, but certainly not too fine that it's going to overcook the salmon either. Just bringing that, sim that dough over to meet the salmon. Pressing it down. Just over uh, cut the overlap of salt dough out. Now it doesn't need to look tidy as long as it's encasing it, because we're going to take that salt dough off at the end of the cooking process. So what we have here is some beautifully clean skin. Just very gently roll that out, or press it out. We've got some Marlborough flaky salt here. I use that because it is a lot sweeter than the normal iodized. It just dries it out just like your pork crackling. We're going to now put that in the oven, 180 degrees, for around about 12 to 13 minutes, uh, just till it crisps up. The next part of this process is something very dear to my heart, it was actually a component that I used for the Aura King Salmon Awards two years ago. So what we've got is a piece of the loin, we're going to roll that in some spice mix which we have here. We've got some local olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Just going to drizzle that over the top, good amount, beautiful colour, really fruity. Just rolling that. We're then going to pop this in the spice mix. Give it a really good coating. Next part of this is I'm going to take some glad wrap, roll that piece of salmon up. Just like you would with sushi, really nice and tight. Roll it up. And there we are. We're now going to pop that into some boiling water, or poaching water, sorry. It's just simmering away. We're going to leave that sitting there for about five minutes. Whilst that's cooking, we're going to get on to marinating up the beautiful piece of belly. So this here, we've got some miso paste. We've got some sake. We've got some flaky salt and a little bit of caster sugar. And what we're going to do is we're going to mix that all together and make a nice little marinade. And then we're either going to cry back it in a vacuum sealer or we're going to leave it in a bowl for three days. Now the measurements of this will all depend on how much you're making and the intensity of what you want it to be. We're going to take the salmon belly. Because it's quite a big piece of belly, we're just going to pop that in the curing mix, give it a wee turnover. So what we've got now, we've got that product impermeating in that liquid. We're going to leave it for three days before we slice it up. Three days later, or one we've prepared a little earlier on, we've got some salmon, it's beautifully marinated. All those flavours are going to be impounded into that component of the fish. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to take that salmon skin from the oven. Nice dry cloth. Beautifully crisped up. We're going to use that a little bit later for the decoration on the dish. Okay, now what we're going to do is pop this baby in the oven. So that's that piece of salmon loin that we've rolled up in the salt dough. 180 degrees. 
That's roughly going to take about 10 to 12 minutes, but just check it. So we've got here some cleaned up cheeks, put a little bit of gremolata. Gremolata is a combination of parsley, garlic and lemon. Just turn that over, give it a nice crumb. And again, we're going to put a little bit of flaky salt on there, just prior to cooking. Just a little bit of oil in there. What I'm going to do is put the outside of the salmon cheek in first. And that's going to be my presentation side. That's going to sizzle away. You can see it's just starting to cook around the edges. I don't want it to overcook. I also don't want the garlic to burn. So I'm just going to lower that temperature down a little bit. Just with a spoon, just gently turn those over. And then I'm actually going to take that off the pan, off the heat, and just let that cook away. All right, now we've got that ready to come, come out of the oven. It is very, very hot. And just lift that salt crust off. We're going to let that sit for just a couple of seconds before we cut that off. Now it is going to crumble away a little bit. This is great for summertime, great for entertaining. So you can slice it up, have it for all your friends. Now that's the hero of the show. So we just want to put those somewhere on display quite prominently. Now this is a platter that will easily feed between four and six, or one or two if you really love salmon, like myself. So folks, what we have here is the entirety of the Aura King salmon. Uh, we've got a breakdown of the loin, which has been wrapped and baked in the salt dough. We've got the midloin, which has been poached with the Chilean guava beer and brown sugar. We've got pieces of the belly, which has been cured in the sake and miso. We've got pieces of the cheek, which has had a little bit of coating of gremolata on there. And then last but not least, we've got pieces of the crispy skin, which is just going to give a little bit of crackling to it, just like you have with your traditional roast pork. And to go with that today, we've got a combination of organic vegetables coming from James Cameron's farm just up the road, and some beans grown in one of the local greenhouses. Enjoy.